Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming along to this after this morning's, I should say, this morning's final session of Suburban Tales from Ordinary to Extraordinary. We've certainly had a fascinating weekend. If any of you have seen the previous sessions, you'll know that uh, we're no doubt in for some more amazing tales from our own backyard. We have a wide range of speakers today, which I won't introduce. We'll leave that up to Di, our wonderful facilitator, as she has a, a far harder job than me. Um, I'll put you in their hands now. Thank you for coming. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for donating your Sunday morning to the Ideas Festival. How would you feel if you were part of a minority? Perhaps you are. What's it like to tick another box or category on an official form? Do people talk or act differently around you? Do people in the suburbs really understand your needs and challenges? Today we talk to five fabulous people who understand what it's like to be in a minority or help those people in the community who are part of a minority. Um, today we have five wonderful people, Andrew Bly from Heath on High, uh, Yasmin Khan from Edfet, Sally Gardner from the Heart Army, um, liver specialist Dr Kelly Slater and Agrisha Cliff from the Ecumenical us here today as well from the brigade. Yasmin, if I can speak to you first, you're part of a minority group that cops a bit of flack in the media, um, but your community has been in Australia for a long time. We have. Um, people seem to think that Muslims arrived in Australia after September 11. <laughs> 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 but we were here before Captain Arthur Phillip, and, uh, and that's the thing that we miss about our history. People talk about Muslims integrating in Australia. We've been integrated right from before white man ever even came here. Mm. Um, there are many uh, historical, um, uh, there's much historical data about uh, Makassan traders with the uh, Northern Territory um, uh, Aborigines and the Torres Strait Islands Aborigines and the trading that they had with their, and if you go to graveyards in Darwin and in Thursday Island, you'll see some Muslim names or Muslim sounding names that they've anglicised or whatever. So there is a long history back to the 1600s of Muslim uh, participating in Australian society with the Aborigines. Um, so to suggest that uh, Muslims aren't integrating, uh, I can understand the frustration that people have because there's been such a, in the last 10 years, it's so visible and there's been such a, a higher migrant intake from Muslim countries in the last 10 years. So that integration is going to take some time. But to say that we're not part of Australian society is not understanding what the facts are about Australian history. Now, you try to create a bit of understanding through Eidfest. So we can did. you tell me about that? In 2005, we started Eidfest, which, was a, uh, or which is the celebration of the end of Ramadan. And Ramadan, we have two festivals a year. One is uh, celebrating the end of Ramadan and one is the celebrating of the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage that goes to Mecca. Now, with the pilgrimage that goes to Mecca, I suppose the only people that actually get something out of it are the people that are actually in Mecca. And the people that are left behind, well, we have our celebrations, um, but it's not as big as, as, the, as the other one is, or as those people that are experiencing in Mecca. So the big one that we have is the Ramadan one, because everyone, I mean, if you're a once-a-year Muslim, you celebrate Ramadan. Is and, there such a thing as a once-a-year Muslim? There are, and you will go. You go to the mosques every Friday, and there will be, each mosque will be full, and if you count across all the mosques, you're probably looking at, you know, three, four, five thousand people. But you go to a, after uh, Ramadan, the big festival that we have, uh, which is not ours, but the big prayer day on that one day, um, and you'd get 10,000 people at a prayer session. And, and you will see them. You won't see them again until next Ramadan again. <laughs> so they're once a year Muslims, and, right. and they might have lost touch with their daily thing, or they might not even go to a mosque. That, uh, and, and I can't sort of disparage them by saying they're once a year Muslims. Um, but they might not participate in the Muslim community on a day to day or a weekly basis. Yes, just like and you Christians will, going to a absolutely. church at Christmas. Yeah, that's right. So everyone go, makes an effort to go to midnight mass at mm. Christmas time because it's a special occasion, and it's the same with Eid, with uh, with Ramadan. And uh, what we decided to do was that because Ramadan was such a big occasion, everyone got involved in it, and it was so. If you mention Ramadan as a as a, a, a just as a word to a non-Muslim, everyone will know what Ramadan is. It's mm. the fasting month. Mm. So it was something that was easy to for people to understand. So what we decided was because our community was so diverse, and we've got Bosnians and Turks and you know Japanese Muslims and Pakistanis mm. and Indians and Fijians. What they used to do was each celebrated their own end of Ramadan 
celebration in a way that was exclusive to them. Mm. So South Africans celebrated and Sudanese celebrated and Somali celebrated, but no one ever celebrated together mm. as a community. So what we decided was that we would hold a festival that, A, we got all of those people together initially to celebrate together as a Muslim community and then use that as a showcase to the non-Muslim community to, sh to showcase our diversity in culture and language and dance and music and food and dress so that you didn't sort of say, well, oh, there's a woman dressed head to toe, she must be Muslim. Mm. It wasn't necessarily the case. Not all Arabs are Muslims and not all Muslims are Arabs. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea that was being um, sent out to the community that if you are dressed this way, you're a Muslim. So, but that wasn't the case. There are Muslims that cover, there are Muslims that don't cover, there are Muslims that do all sorts of things, and there are black, white and red Muslims. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to show was that diversity. So how have the non-Muslims embraced Eid Fest? Well, they come, and that's what I say to them, even if you come only just to experience the food, mm. Wonderful. That's one extra person <laughs> in the gate. So th I want you to come just to experience the food because you're going to get a wide variety of food. You're not coming, and, and I'm not disparaging the, the panieri, but to go there you're only going to eat Greek food. Mm -hmm. To come to ours you're going to eat Greek food, you're going to eat Turkish food, you're going to eat Indian Wonderful. food, you're going to eat a whole heap of different ones. Yeah. So in that regard we're totally multicultural. And people say, oh, uh, Muslims don't understand multiculturalism. Well, excuse me, hang on. You know, there's only a billion of us out, out there and we're not all <laughs> one culture. So, so we understand the diversity of multiculturalism and we embrace that. Um, it takes us a bit of time because, um, you know, like I said, we all celebrate in our own different cultural group and to get them together was a bit difficult, but we got there. But what it says to the non-Muslims and what I want to say to the non-Muslims is come along and understand and to understand the people that's, that practice the religion, you understand the religion a little bit better. And we're not all uniform people and we're not all the same and we don't all dress the same and we don't all wear the same. And we have our own difficulties within the community. And I get it all the time with Eid Fest that we'll boycott Eid Fest because it has music. You know, music is this big sin to some people in, in Islam. And that's the difficulty we have, that even within our own, we're not settled as to how um, uh, Islam should be practised and, 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 you know, portrayed in Australia. And that's the difficulty that we have, that we've got to come up and fight our own community constantly as well as representing a unified voice to the outside community. So let's talk about that. Now, you've got a bit of a bone to pick with some of the new Muslims that come into this country. What's your concerns there? Well, I have a, a problem. I don't even know that it's the new Muslims, but I just think that people take the new Muslims or the experience of new Muslims and think, well, we've got to change everything in Australia to suit the new Muslims. If you ask the new Muslims, they've got, they're just glad that they've got a roof over their head and a clean glass of water. Mm. So the new arrivals that have arrived here, they've made a conscious decision to come. I think people hijack their plight and suggest that, well, we've got to offer halal restaurants in every corner, we've got to offer a mosque on every street, and we've got to do that because these new Muslims are coming, and especially AFIC have put in a claim now to the multicultural... Um, uh, inquiry that's with the federal parliament at the moment and saying that, you know, we need to offer uh, halal finance and halal uh, food and we need to do all this, otherwise we're going to have a ghetto situation. Well, that's not right. For people, my family's been here for 150 years. We never had an issue. I grew up in North Queensland. To this day, we don't have a halal butcher in North Queensland. And that covers from, you know, Rockhampton North, just about. There's no uh, specific halal butcher. So if you wanted halal meat, you had to get somebody out in the farm to kill it and then had to make an arrangement with the local butcher that he'd cut your meat up before he'd cut everyone else's up so that everything was nice and clean. And we did that for years and we still do that today. It's only just recently that they're getting halal chicken up there because Steggles is all halal. Mm -hmm. So those people that can get Steggles chicken, it, it's all halal. So, so they've mm -hmm. got access to that. But they don't have halal meat up there. Mm -hmm. They've got to make arrangements to go and get it done and it's, and it's, and it's an effort for new arrivals to come here and say, well, what sort of country is this? There's nothing, they're not providing anything for Muslim people. Well, you know, welcome to our world. We've had to struggle all our lives and what difference does it make to you? The problem is, of course, is that a lot of new arrivals come from mono-religious, monocultural mm -hmm. countries and they have got to get used to multiculturalism and multi-religious societies. It, absolutely it is. Do you find when you hear controversial comments from Muslim clerics and especially about women do you just sigh and think oh no you, you know again you're tarring the whole muslim community um I, I look at it 
um, it, sometimes in frustration and you just think, well, look, are we on to that again or whatever? But um, they're, be, they're becoming more and more isolated. I mean, these people, I think there was a guy talking on a current affair the other day. He's not a cleric. I mean, not that I watch. Um, I just saw the, the shorts to it, so I didn't see it. Um, but he's not a cleric. He didn't represent anyone. You know, people talk about this uh, terrorist cell down in Melbourne. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't a cleric either. He must have had, you know, 15 people under him, and that was mm. his whole army. Well, mm. you know, how far are you going to get with that? Mm. So uh, I think what happens is that... that the media like to sensationalise it and think, oh, well, you know, we're sort of out of the loop of the, the, the London bombings or the New York bombings or whatever, so any little tiny thing will, you know, expand it and think, well, Australia's also a threat. Mm. Um, like I said, we've been here a long time. Um, mm. I don't want it to be threatened and, um, and I have a total disregard for anyone that wants to threaten it because you're, only th you're not only threatening um, uh, my country but you're threatening um, my family and my neighbourhood and, and my community and, and I take offence um, at anybody that wants to do that. Mm. But as far as clerics go, um, they get shouted down fairly quickly. I think there are very few people and those sorts of things, um, they get dismissed very quickly because there's, uh, the, the feminist side of Islam, I suppose, is starting to sort of make some inroads and be heard and mm. and uh, and now as people get more and more educated, people are just saying, well, where's it written? Mm. Where, where's the proof? Yeah. Yeah, that's your interpretation, but where's the proof? Mm. Where's it written in the Quran? It doesn't tell you in the Quran that you even have to cover your head. Mm. So um, if we want to talk about being explicit, let's be explicit. Mm. It doesn't tell you in the Quran. There is nowhere, not one word in the Quran that says it must cover your head. Mm. So we've got to then look it back and say, well, is it a cultural thing? Is it, uh, you know, where does all, where does all this come from, and where does this extremism go to? And Muslims know how to have fun. I mean, you enjoy Christmas. Certainly do. <laughs> Some Muslims know how to have fun. Because yeah. <laughs> we even get, like I said, even at Eid Fest, we get Muslims coming up to us <laughs> and saying, "How do you have all this music?" <laughs> And then I'm thinking, well, you paid money to come in here. It cost you $2 to pay at the door and you paid and then come in here and criticise me. How dare you? And, that, and that's what I say to new Muslims too. You know, it's not an Islamic thing to do, to go to somebody's house and to tell them that, they, that their furniture's all wrong, that they've got to change yeah. it. That's not right. That's not an Islamic thing to do. And if you want to be a true Muslim, then understand that uh, Islam teaches you respect and honesty and, and, uh, and some gratitude towards yeah. your hosts. Yeah. So that's one thing I would say. But as far as... Um, uh, having a good time, I don't understand. And, and I would think that if you went back and had a look at uh, these new rules about, um, oh, well, we're not going to have Easter celebrations or we're not going to put decorations up in the, in the shopping centres and that, I think it's terrific. It adds to the festival atmosphere and it's a fun time and it's a terrific time and I love giving Christmas gifts. I like receiving Christmas gifts. But it's all about being a part of a community and uh, as we go and celebrate Buddha's birthday and we celebrate Chinese New Year, well, what difference is it about uh, Christmas? And what is it that we're celebrating about Christmas? If we want to look at the religious aspect of it, we're celebrating the birth of Christ. Well, what's wrong with that? Christ was also one of God's disciples, uh, God's prophets. So, you know, are we not, we're not celebrating anything that we don't believe in. We celebrate it, we understand Jesus and, and we understand that he was a, a prophet of God and we understand his message and we believe in the Bible and all those sorts of things. So we're not celebrating something that's totally against our religion or that's totally against our beliefs. So um, I would just say to people, chill, and I would suggest <laughs> to Muslims to chill, but I would also suggest that those people that have made those decisions haven't come from a Muslim background or haven't come from any Muslim pressure whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I think that they don't want to upset the apple cart, so they just want to pull out all of the, the fun before it even gets to that. And I would think that if you had nice decorations up in the street or whatever, that nobody would object to that. Now, Andrew Blythe, the gay community, they know how to have fun. They do. <laughs> They're not very well renowned for it. Um, the, the gay lesbian mind draw is probably one of the the largest, most visual um, spectacles on a lot of different countries' calendars. Um, but it wasn't always the case. They've, um, prior to those sorts of festivals coming about, they were often um, reviled for that sense of having fun, for not um, taking their place in society and for being frivolous uh, mm -hmm. about their lives. And that's, that's slowly changing, and that, uh, that festival will change as that community evolves as well. And do you think that camouflages some of the serious issues that you as the editor of Queensland Pride have come across. Can you tell us a little bit about some of that? Absolutely. Um, 
probably the Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras is the largest cultural festival that anywhere around the world would identify as a gay and lesbian festival. And it's often seen in those extremities, lots of colour, lots of light, lots of music, lots of happiness. And it is. It was meant to be a celebration um, after years and years of being repressed as a community. But that repression still goes on in, in lots of different ways. And one of the questions that we talked about earlier was, was there still a need to report on this? Was there still a need to talk about this? Because when you look at events like the Mardi Gras, you can be misled into thinking that, that everything is fine for that community, and it isn't. So uh, my job as editor is to try and ferret out those stories and tell all the different kinds of stories, because there is no one gay community as such. It's made up of lots and lots of different groups of people, so, and some of whom are hurting so, uh, still to this day. So some of the big issues are drugs and alcohol and also domestic violence, which might surprise a few people. Definitely. Um, mental health is going to become, in the next 10 to 15 years, huge on the agenda of the gay and lesbian community because the mainstream health services have not reacted well to that community. They've not been culturally sensitive to the services that have been put in place. And because drugs and alcohol in any community is a huge component of mental health at the moment, and the authorities are now recognising that, it's an even bigger problem in the gay and lesbian community because drugs and alcohol have played such an integral part into creating the identities of the people that form that community. Drinking particularly, uh, and that's not to say that that's a bad thing, but because um, pubs form such a large part of that culture, uh, and because there isn't the help there that for people that need it, drinking um, becomes a huge problem. And the other problem, um, now that our relationships are becoming more and more recognised uh, and more and more long-standing, is that just in any relationships, um, domestic violence is cropping up um, as being a huge problem. And again, it's not really being addressed yet. The, the social services that have put the services in place to deal with domestic violence know a lot about how women are often the victims of violence and how power relationships work. They really struggle to try and understand if it's two men or two women or one of the partners might be a, a transgender person. They really struggle to understand because they determine that people's sex roles determine that men are powerful, women are weak. Well, that's not the case at all but that that current of domestic violence of one weak person and one dominant person does follow through. So they really struggle to understand how to engage with that couple and how to wrap the services around them so that they can resolve those problems. Do the police service take it seriously if they went to the home of um, two gay men and there was a report of domestic violence? How would they... The, the, the anecdotal evidence suggests that they don't. They, they understand two men... Um, and there is a component of the police service, the a gay and lesbian liaison service, and they often, we rely on them to educate other officers, but by and large, no, two officers coming to a domestic violence dispute don't understand. They just assume that, well, can't they just belt each other and make up and get on with it? <laughs> they don't understand that, you know, there's a lot more going on than that. It's not just two men having a fight. It's two men in a relationship, in a very unequal power relationship, um, that are just as vulnerable as, as a man or a woman might be in that relationship. Okay. The State Library magazine last year did an interview with um, Michael Kirby, the former High Court Justice, um, and he said, I can talk forever about the importance of equity and human rights, um, but really it's the sitcoms, it's the soap operas that really help the issue. <coughs> Absolutely. Uh, and, and I also had the pleasure um, of interviewing the former Justice Michael Kirby last year. He's a very erudite person who mm -hmm. sees things in their entirety. And he's absolutely right. One of the, as a community, you are at your most visible um, when you enter mainstream media. Um, and with the representations that we see of people now, one of the things that the early gay media did was they would report, for instance, when a gay character was in a soap opera or, or when a major character in a book was found, and they would celebrate that fact. 
Now more and more, those characters have entered the mainstream culture, mm -hmm. and we don't even think to report on that now, because it, it is just so common. Uh, now more often than not, they'll have a look at that person and say, well, is he gay? The next question will be, well, is he cute? So <laughs> is he worth watching? And the next question they might ask is, can he act? Um, so th th there's that nice, nice evolution on from there. But it used to be the case that once upon a time, the only thing that gay men died of was HIV, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of popular culture. You, you, you know, in a storyline, and they might not die of cancer or you know the relationship might not break up and they might not die of a broken heart so whereas now they're just accepted uh, as as characters and what's good is that often it's not even an issue within those dramas or soap operas or the media itself often the characters themselves don't comment on that fact someone's introduced they might be gay or lesbian and no one bats an eyelid so so i think for mainstream media in some ways you can the all clear sirens have sounded now, you know. No one, no one bothers no. anymore, yeah. so, uh, wh which is great. And yeah. do you think it's easy, though? I still think it must, uh, a male or female actor must hesitate before coming out because, you know, it, it could still reduce roles. Do you think there might just be the moment of hesitation? Oh, I think so. Um, I think for anyone still in the entertainment industry, there's still that dichotomy whereby it employs a disproportionate number uh, from the gay and lesbian community. However, they still, um, they still challenge those roles. I know in entertainment circles they question whether um, a gay actor can play a straight role, which I find is interesting because equally um, can, a, can a straight actor play a gay role. So, um, so you know, I think they would, still, they would still think about that. But I think that the acceptance overall, a lot of them now are going and saying, well, I'll, I'll give it a go, you know. And I think there are plenty of high-profile cases out there whereby someone's taken on a gay or a lesbian role and they've, they've, it's not ruined their career at all. There are plenty of high-profile cases. Matt Smith, for instance, who is the current Doctor Who, um, played uh, Christopher Isherwood recently in a film that was put out by the BBC. Um, and he did it because he didn't want to become typecast as Doctor Who. He wanted to prove that as an actor he could play plenty of other different roles. And, and he's only received good praise for that. Mm. So I think there are plenty of high-profile role models out there to do that now. And there are yeah. plenty of films like Brokeback Mountain where the heterosexual actors who are paying, playing these roles kind of feel normal. <laughs> <laughs> I think it proves that uh, it really doesn't matter who is doing what, it's whether the portrayal or not is accurate. And I mean, Brokeback Mountain told a very tortured love story. So if the people can do it, whoever can, can perform that role, they should be given the chance to, to take that on, definitely. Do you hope one day that Queensland Pride doesn't exist, that you are not the editor of a gay publication, you are just the editor of a publication? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, media itself is changing all of the time. And I think most recently, the change we've seen, journalists everywhere are worried about their jobs at the moment because as media becomes more and more fragmented, the mass media itself is not going to appeal to a lot of people because we are not a mass population. We all have very distinct interests. And I think the media will become more and more segmented and we will subscribe to those batches of information that appeal to us. And I'd like to think that eventually there will be a point where my reporting on something from a gay and lesbian aspect is absolutely redundant because mm. no one cares mm. that it's just accepted as just another perspective and that that's not the defining part of that story. Mm. It's who that person is, what their attributes are, what their qualities, what are we saying about the society that we live in, and the fact that they're gay, lesbian, transgender, <coughs> intersex or bisexual, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm. So, yes, I certainly do hope that how that day will come. How long away are we from that? Do you think Ooh, that's just a pistol? How, long do I need, how long do I need to stay in work <laughs> for? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> No, no, I, I, I would like to see a lot more crossover with mainstream media. And, and they are. I picked up the Courier Mail's Weekend magazine and they've done a lovely profile on Linda Hibbert who works um, as a counsellor and a social worker with uh, the young people through the Open Doors programme, the uh, gay, lesbian um, and transgender youth programme. So I think when people like that can be profiled in mainstream media and there aren't a flurry of letters to the editor saying, how dare you write about you know, these sorts of things, I think, well, that's great. That's really good. Our, our message is getting out there and our job is done. So. Mm. It must be frustrating, though. Here you are living in a secular society and even with issues like same-sex marriage where you're still excluded from that option. Is it? 
frustrate you, or how do you it feel frustra- about it? It frustrates me because the uh, the other problem with our media, and this this applies to any media, is is that media still needs to sell newspapers. It still needs to sell advertising space. So they get a story and take the aspects of the story that they think are going to sell that. And the marriage debate is a huge, huge debate. And one of the problems is is it's not often presented as a human rights issue. It's presented as a marriage issue. And at the end of the day, all it simply means is that one portion of our community is not given the right to express themselves in a relationship that the rest (coughs) of the community is given. Now, regardless of whether you want to get married or not, regardless of whether how you view those relationships, at the end of the day, I, as a gay man, cannot do what my heterosexual counterpart can do. I don't care how we do that. I don't care whether I have to get married or not. All I care about is, is that I have the same right. I pay the same taxes. I do the same things. All I want is that right to be able to express myself the same way. I don't think marriage is the best vehicle at all for two people necessarily to get together, but I want that right. You want the option to reduce Absolutely, it. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And often those, those finer parts of that debate are not represented in the media. So when a prominent gay or lesbian person comes up and says, well, I don't want to get married, that's immediately taken to say is, well, you don't support that. What they don't support is necessarily the idea of marriage as a vehicle to do that. <coughs> What they do re- support, and which never gets reported, is they do support that human rights aspect, that it's fundamentally wrong at the end of the day in a secular society that you do not have that right. Because with that right comes enormous um, legal and, and personal privileges with that. Uh, once upon a time in our communities, people getting married were quizzed before they did, they were scrutinised, they were interrogated. The community, in some communities, had the rights to knock back that marriage. We don't have any of that today. If you want to get married, you could be married by the end of the day. It's that simple. I can't, and I just ask, please give me that fundamental right to do that. Thank you, Linda. Um, we might look now to a different kind of minority group. Um, Sally Gardner is from Heart Army. Now, Heart Army came together in the wake of this year's terrible floods in Queensland. Um, and the people who you look after were part of the mainstream, generally, and then they find that they're marginalised because of a particular event. Can you tell me a little bit about Heart Army, please? Yes. Um, there's over 850 families that we've been able to support so far, both in the Lockyer Valley, first of all, and then in southeast Queensland and in north Queensland after Cyclone Yasi. So we're covering more than 27 local areas in southeast Queensland and also in north Queensland. Um, there's, there's a lot of different stories and really the way we support them is through um, our website at brisbaneadoption.org and three different Facebook pages. That all sounds very impersonal, but really it's just a group of most of the people supporting and providing that um, <coughs> that personal face to to our community support are just young, uh, young or older mums like myself. So we've all got, really the common thing is we've got, um, so Samantha who's here with me, she has, has three children at home, I've got two and um, Justine, who works in North Queensland, has um, five children under the age of six. And really, we're just about sharing the stories of farmers and locals in Brisbane and the Lockyer Valley who have been flood affected or cyclone affected in the last um, few months. And the stories differ. So there's, there's farmers who Justine's looking after that are just embarrassed that they need to ask for help and there's people asking for help for them. There's, you know, a single mum that I'm looking after in, in Sherwood who, who is, you know, d- didn't know that there was people there who were still happy to help but is, is really pleased to be able to now have, you know, school lunch boxes to send her kids to school with and desks for them to study with and things like that. So Some just... Some victims feel as if they have been forgotten because the initial euphoria of all the volunteering yes. is obviously over. Yes. People gone back to their jobs. And just listening to Andrew's story before, it's, it's amazing how... Different experiences in life will make people marginalised in the community. And what we've experienced too is that I suppose it was families who were uh, families or couples who are already a little bit um, a little bit at risk anyway that are falling through the cracks a little bit um, now, so to speak. So um, the media, in 
perhaps I could say that we've been misled a little by our community that everything's fine. Our community wishes and wants people to be okay. So they meet a flood affected, I'm sure they might be a flood affected family even here, but they meet the, those people in the street and they go, oh, it's good to see you, you know, everything must be all back and okay now. I went into a 79 year old lady's house in Oxley three days ago. Her house is a slab of concrete and her children tried to help her her and her husband lift up the tiles, so they jackhammered gigantic big holes in the concrete of her slab. She's got like this lovely little outdoor area where she's living from a barbecue, and her and so is she's just so. And you say to her, "What is it that you miss most of all?" And she said, "Sally, I haven't got a mix master to make my granddaughters a cheesecake." So my granddaughter came to visit me and said, "Grandma, where's my cheesecake?" And I haven't got anything to bake, and no, no, and I can't, and I haven't got my sunbeam mix master that 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 I really, you know, enjoy using with my granddaughters. So, in, you know... They must be so diverse, mustn't they? Were they yes. On the lunch boxes, to the yes. mixed and to the farmers. Yes. So, we're, on the farmer side, um, we need 1,500 star pickets and 98 tonnes of fencing products. But we try to break that down into chunks that mean something to just a normal family. So, 70, if people donate $70, we can buy one roll of barbed wire. So, it's a little bit like Oxfam's... Let's buy a goat. So, <laughs> but before you buy a goat, can you first help buy a roll of barbed wire for the Lockyer Valley farmers down the road? Because they've got, goats in. yeah, so they can keep our, yeah, sheep and cattle and horses <coughs> in so that we can all have food on our plates in downtown Brisbane. Because, yeah, I think it's, it's trying to just bring it home that it's really just down the road. And if we all, you know, wear clothes made of cotton and, and eat pumpkins from the Lockyer Valley, we well, sort of need fences to keep things in. So, and it seems such a huge, huge thing to do, but really it's just, the way we're doing it is just one story at a time to tell a story about that family. So, um, you know, something that I, that I, it is hard to do, but when, you, when you're an empathetic person, but if you sit and have a coffee with those, with each family that you look after and just write up their story. And I put the hugest list I've ever seen in my life from a, I needed a fridge to, um, you know, a fridge to, um, towels to lunch boxes for my single mum at Sherwood with four kids. Had coffee with her the other day. She said, Sally, just found out I'm pregnant again. So four and a half kids. And we've been able to provide like the longest list of, of physical items for her, but just the fact that she she's now started to go to counselling that she didn't think she could ever do. She started to go to counselling and... Um, you know, is looking after her children and herself a lot better yeah. is a really good thing. So, yeah. And your website talks about your adoption service. Yes. Tell us that sounds rather unique. So it is rather unique. So that I think to give people a bit of ownership, you're able to, we have the website's called brisbaneadoption.org but it, and we have three Facebook pages that link to that. So you can either adopt a family in North Queensland and organise to um, send gift cards that Justine will use at the in the local community in Tully, for instance, to buy local goods at the, at the IGA. Or you can um, adopt a, a flood-affected family in southeast Queensland or the Lockyer Valley when we list exactly what they need there. So it might be that they need new towels and you throw a few extra towels in when you go to Target or you might um, send us a $100 gift voucher and they can buy themselves new clothes every, next time you go to a different store so it's really easy to help and you just have a look at those stories and you feel that you're contributing by adopting that family or that child in that way and um and clearly those families just think it's fantastic when they get wonderful new things it's not to support them it's no as well, isn't it? Take, maybe taking someone to the doctors or yes you know practical yes. things like that as well yes so um practical and emotional support so just um the young mum I was telling you about just before, you know, the fact that I took, I could take her for coffee and have a half hour conversation with her, that meant that it went from, no Sally, I'm never going to counselling ever in my life, I'd much rather talk to, you know, another mum like you, to, oh Sally, I did go and it was really, really good and I'm starting to work through a few yeah. issues. So just that um, personal community support, that are just things that we all probably did during the flood, but w in South East Queensland or in North Queensland during the cyclone, but just taking it that step further so that we don't forget about our neighbours who just live just down the road, that you think, well, there really is things we can do every day to still support those families. Yeah. What sort of reaction has, have you been getting from people who are volunteering? What sort of numbers are we seeing? What sort of stories are you hearing from the volunteers? Um, in terms of... In 
Yeah, the volunteers just honestly there's been one lady who's a grandma she's also a foster mum and I don't know this woman like picks up furniture from all over Brisbane hoiks it around in a trailer with three of the kids in the back and then she'll you know some a lady at Bundamba will need a coffee table so she'll be she'll be you know to deception bay to pick up a spare coffee table and somewhere else to pick up new doona covers and bring me the doona covers and take the coffee table to the lady at Bundamba. You just, it is just so hard to describe the absolutely amazing day-to-day -day just stories of what people will do to help each other out. Mm -hmm. And these are all people that they've never met before and yeah, just. And how many people are logging onto your site and um, saying, yes, I'm going to help? We have had 750,000 <laughs> hits per fortnight. So we have about, over the three Facebook pages, we have about 6,000 um, um, people or who are involved in what we're doing. So having, getting a daily look at what we're, what we're achieving. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of silent watches, which is good, but it'd be really good if a lot more people would donate to, <laughs> to help us physically support people and, and emotionally support people. Mm. Turn now to Agrita Cliff and Nicole. Um, you both belong to the beautifully lyrically sounding Ecumenical Coffee Brigade. Now you've been going for 40 years now. Can you tell us about your passion for the Agrita? Yes, we are. Um, the organisation started, I think, in 1970 with um, an ex nun, Louisa Toogood, who saw a need to administer services, hot food and drink to the homelessness of Brisbane, Bris particularly Brisbane CBD. And she started, uh, she started that, uh, the organisation back then in her Morris Minor um, with uh, one or two helpers uh, around Brisbane. So, and over the... <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it does bring a very <laughs> colourful image um, to mind. So she started back that process back in 1970 and although um, the faces have changed in our volunteer base over that time, um, we've really kept it very simple. Um, we want to, our objective is to continue to, to bring that service to, our, to the homelessness of Brisbane every day of the year. So that's, that's what we... So that's what makes the service different. Can you tell us about the point of difference? Yes, um, whilst there are a lot of other uh, services who are, um, administer services to the homelessness around Brisbane, uh, we make sure rain, hail and shine every day of the year that the van goes out, that there's a sense of uh, community. Uh, we have maybe anywhere between 70 and 120 people uh, come to one of our four stops in Brisbane every day of the year. Um, and uh, yeah, that's... that's that's the objective of the van. So, and you've got two groups. You've got the people making the coffees and the sandwiches and then those going out into the van. Yeah, there, there are two types of uh, van, uh, volunteer base. Um, we've got teams of van crews, anywhere between two and three, who drive the van around to the four stops. And, uh, and uh, I really like the front line. They, they uh, bring a sense of, I guess, joy and happiness every, every morning. Um, to our, to our clients, our colourful clients. And there are also our uh, teams of sandwich makers, some of which have, have been going for 20 or 30 years. They come along. Sandwich makers. Has the, the, uh, the kind of sandwich they make, has that changed at all? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it, it has. A, there's a little bit more variety. W once upon a time, it was either ham or cheese. <laughs> now, you know, now we've branched out. There's sometimes egg, Vegemite. <laughs> Peanut butter. <laughs> strange request. I must have gluten free. <laughs> Funnily enough, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we, we often uh, we often get the request for uh, a happy meal. <laughs> or <laughs> you accommodate the happy meal, <laughs> or you just yes. buy the sandwich with a smile. That's right. Yes, <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> you should sign up, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about homelessness in Brisbane? Is it is it changing or is it generally the same issues and it has the same profile as it always has? Look, there are, uh, from what we see, and we try not to ask too many questions, yeah. um, that's not really sort of our place, but uh, we see a lot of people who frequent the van do for a number of reasons. Um, not all of them are homeless, um, but uh, the majority are, and they might be homeless for a 
you know, for a wide range of reasons, whether that be broken homes, broken families. Um, a lot of our clients um, have or at some point or do now suffer from mental illness. Mm. Um, so we see uh, those types of clients as well. Are um, they, do they have more access to help in terms of um, dealing with their mental illness or do they just really use your service as a point of community and support? Yes, I think the reason they, they frequent the van um, every morning is, to, is for that sense of community and support. Um, I expect they, um, or some of them probably battle on with whatever they're suffering mm -hmm. with, but um, if they can come along and, and talk to others each morning, um, that gives them a sense of relief. Mm. And not everyone is homeless who seeks um, food and drink from the brigade. Although some of them live in boarding houses, they have a bed, but... That, that's right, yeah. Some, um, there are a group who, who do frequent the van who um, live, some of them together, in a boarding house um, or at boarding houses up on Gregory Terrace um, mm -hmm. and around the place. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we offer the same service to anyone who, who attends. Uh, we don't ask questions. We just, uh, we're just there with a, a coffee and a, a sandwich mm. and a smile. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot to be said for that. And there must be some amazing characters that you come across. And, and, and really, as we were discussing before, um, even though many homeless people are marginalised and at the fringes, they are also held um, with a level of affection by people within the suburbs because they know them, they, when they're not there they worry about them, they sometimes try and help. What sort of characters are um, you see? Yeah, you're quite right. We have, uh, we have quite a few uh, characters who we see every day. Some probably are familiar to people here. Um, uh, we have a, a guy, Terry, who probably uh, many know as the Tawong Bag Man who, um, who comes along every day and um, you might see him around now. He's a little bit, he's a little bit more well-kept, uh, shorter hair. Uh, he's, a, he's a lot tidier now. He, I think, had a bout in hospital and they cleaned him up a little bit. Um, but he's still back frequent, frequenting the van and, and keeping all the other guys in line. Uh, and, and it's funny, they, uh, they don't let us leave. And if they know he's coming, they don't let us leave the stop until, uh, until Terry arrives. So he's just but, but one. Uh, Nicole was out on the van this morning uh, and bumped into another guy, who uh, Trevor, who likes to um, dress up in, in, <laughs> in all sorts of uh, uniforms or, or outfits he can find. Uh, do you want to, do you want to give to our anniversary party last year with a Batman mask on? Um, <laughs> sometimes he celebrate, celebrates Christmas in September. He'll be wearing his um, Father Christmas outfit. Today he was wearing a ski mask with his cycling gear. And he's just a whole lot of fun. And when he's not there, it's just not nearly as exciting. <laughs> now, Nicole, I understand you were approached for a debt service for a certain event. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> Um, we all sort of tend to have our favourites and we always joke about all my boyfriends and all this sort of thing. And one guy said to me, um, and when I say guy, he's in his 70s, he said, I'd really like you to go somewhere with me, I just need a date. And I said, yeah, where? He goes to a friend's wedding. I said, okay, where and when and, you know, what's appropriate to wear and all this sort of thing. He said, oh, whatever you wear, it'll be beautiful. Meet me at the church. And it was a greeter's wedding. I didn't know a greeter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know a greeter so well. Then we weren't together on the committee. And then I was sort of a bit embarrassed because I sort of thought this is a bit weird. And then <laughs> since that time, I've been to lots of things in that same church. And some of them were happy and some of them were saying goodbye to other old friends. And just the other week, we lost one of our guys. And um, it was just so nice to be there with other people from our organisation, but lots of other services that um, supported him. And it was the happiest funeral I've been to. And it was just lovely to be there with the people that have been there with him every day. So, um, yeah, so from happy times to sad times, but all together in the church, it's nice. Mm -hmm. And it must be separate to you for any members of that community do die. But as you said, a surprising 
a group of people might turn up to a funeral of a homeless person. Sometimes you think maybe no one would come, but in fact, no, it's not the case. I, I couldn't believe how many people were there and, and how many lives he touched and how everyone w didn't want to leave. Everyone just stayed and shared stories and said, oh, I didn't know you knew him, I didn't know you knew him, how did you know him? And all the different things that he did do when he stayed very busy and got involved in different organisations and had lots of different support crews. And it's just nice because he did have some problems with alcohol and had health issues and his family were estranged. And then to see that they felt better that he did have a family. And so there was a whole healing all the way around. We all felt nice meeting his family and knowing that they were okay and hearing the stories of when he was a child and all that sort of thing. So whether it's alcohol, mental illness, whatever it is, homelessness, whatever keeps you separate, his joy and everything made us all the same. So that's what was really important. Where homeless people live these days is changing as well because a lot of them traditionally have been in the inner city but because of development that's that's changing isn't it so where are they where are they going where are they making the homes are making the homes in the suburbs or? I, I think we've seen a bit of a push um, where a lot of them are forced to move on elsewhere or out out of the city um, I think uh, from what we've seen and uh, I guess it's one of the things we're, we're questioning now is whether we extend our service to other areas like the Redlands, see um, quite a lot more homelessness um, up there. And uh, so we're, we're sort of uh, monitoring that and, and seeing sort of whether, whether there is a need um, for some of the vans that are frequent, frequenting the same stops we do mm -hmm. to, to move and um, expand. It's not purely donations. Uh, we do get a government grant, um, so we sort of juggle that and, and the donations, very generous donations that we do receive. Mm. So, yeah, it, um, the organisation probably has about 170 volunteers um, and, look, it just couldn't keep going without uh, the generosity of people's time and, and money. Mm. And free money. Yes. Like yes. <laughs> branch out a little bit more there as well. Um, Finally, I'm going to speak with Dr Kelly Slater, who is also part of a rather unusual minority. Um, Kelly, you're a female surgeon. Am I making a noise here? Hang on, I'll just try and turn this out. Is that better? Um, can you tell me a little bit about what it's like working in a fairly male-dominated profession? People, I don't want to call them minorities, but I... I <laughs> you don't feel like I don't feel like <laughs> Yeah. Being a woman, <laughs> um, and people, the, how do I feel working in a male domain? I I don't feel indifferent. I feel like I have colleagues. I don't feel like a woman, particularly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, and <coughs> men treat me in my profession anyway. Treat me exactly as they treat everybody else. Um, with uh, equality, I have to be up at two o'clock in the morning, just like the rest of them. Mm. Um, I've never felt any uh, difficulty advancing in in my career, which is mm. a, a lot. I acknowledge is very lucky for me because I think there are a lot of other professions that there probably is some discrimination to women rising to the top of their field. Mm. Um, in medicine, however, I don't feel that that exists. Um, I think where women often feel discriminated against is is because I, I always tell my junior female staff that you must do the same job as a man does. You can't expect to go away and have children and be absent for a year and come back in the same position. You you have to work exactly the same. Because mm. um, it's pretty yeah. tough, isn't it? I mean, yeah. often the general public um, is outraged about the hours that yeah. doctors like yourself must yeah. put in, but you don't complain about it. No, no and I'm quite a violent supporter against safe working right. hours, to be honest. And uh, yes. it, it's infiltrating medicine like it, it like no one's business. And um, and I guess medicine's always had that very bad reputation for being slave driving. But the truth mm. is that there's only a certain amount of time in your career that you have to learn the skills that you need to um, be a good doctor. Yeah. And those... It, medicine is a real apprenticeship um, mm. um, and 
you, you have to put in extreme hours to get the level of experience that's required. And that's being wasted away by safe working hours. And um, I think we'll find over the next 10 years that the standard of medicine will reflect that. Uh, I warn you. Right. <laughs> well, okay. uh, and uh, so, so you so you don't think the hundred hour week um, affects the the quality of service that you're doing? I don't. I don't. Mm. I don't at all. I think doc doctors and uh, are smart enough, and, and many people are yeah. smart enough to understand when they're tired, when they're exhausted, and <coughs> the, the people regulate themselves with exhaustion. And, and sure, it's very difficult to function when you've been awake for thirty six hours. But <coughs> I I don't think in reality that occurs very often and mm. a lot of the safe working hours harks back to a time where especially in surgery there used to be this level of bullying that went on um, with regards to you know oh you've got to stand on your feet till you fall over and, and that really doesn't exist anymore and I, the, the, what the junior people coming through don't understand is that it, you are you, you must put in the hours to um, gain the experience that's required. So what, what will be the consequence of not putting in those hours? What's, this, what's the depth of this warning that you're giving us today? The, the, they're not seeing enough cases um, and enough uh, situations because medicine is just really learn as you go. You, mm. you have the academic background, the anatomy and all those sort of things, but really it's, a, it's pattern recognition and learn as you go. And unless you're there all the time, you're not going to get that. And the technology must be changing all the time mm. as well. It, right. it, indeed. And um, there's been, uh, I, sorry if I'm being too technical, but there's been a massive change in the last 10 years to keyhole surgery. You may have all heard about that. Mm. And that's markedly watered down the experience that the junior staff are getting because keyhole surgery is a little bit more technically demanding and you have to have a lot of skills in order to, to, to do that. Um, and also, um, the threat of litigation has markedly watered down the junior staff's experience because senior people don't want to necessarily give, give uh, cases and experience to their junior staff for threat of being sued. Mm. Are you seeing more junior staff asking for, well, I really don't want to be working six days a week. I'd actually quite like three or four. We are, l well, like every in every profession, um, this work-life balance has crept into mm. things and... Yeah. To be honest, I, I, I don't think it's um, it's hidden in what's involved in being a doctor, or it hasn't been, in, but, but we're now seeing that junior staff really want to have that lifestyle balance, and mm. that's good, I yeah. guess, in a way, but, but it's... Because um, it seems sensible, doesn't life. it? It seems it, sensible. It does, but I would say surgery, what I do is a calling, and it's a lifestyle, mm. and um, I think unless you want to put your whole heart into it, I don't think... You're going to be very good. On yeah. yeah. Okay. Because you're a mother and yeah. a wife. You have four children. I have. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess I do perhaps have a little bit of work-life balance, but uh, uh, the most common question that I get asked is, how do you do it all, being mm. this woman, mm. you know, this Superwoman. minority woman mm. in the world? But I don't do it all. I, I, my husband's at home full-time and raises, <coughs> one, raises the children and I have a lot of staff that look after me and, you know, we somehow keep it all together. So... No, I, I don't do it all. And similarly, the men in who I work with, they, they do the same. They sacrifice the time with their family and time with their wives, and we, it's the same. So um, it, it's just about a juggling act and mm. I make it happen. You make it happen. Yeah. Now, it seems, though, you when you do find a moment to yourself and you're off shopping for something as mundane as underwear, <laughs> that... Um, a child or a person still seems to have a problem around you. Tell us a little yes. bit about what happened at I the shopping centre <laughs> last year. And you can't get away from it, of course. I, could, I, <laughs> I, I just hadn't been shopping for a really long time and I, I just popped into the shops and I'd had afternoon tea with my husband and my third daughter and he left to pick up the other kids from school and I just said, I've just got to pick up some underwear and then I heard some screaming while I was getting changed. <laughs> I thought, oh, will I go out and 
I thought no, I'll just wait. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's invariably someone who's fallen over or something. Yeah. And then Didn't I need specialist attention. No, really. no, no. <laughs> I heard the screaming got worse and I heard and it sounded like um, the sort of scream that I would make if my children were, were ill or, or, or in trouble. So I got dressed quickly and went out and, and I walked out to the front counter of the lingerie section and there's a small child lying un unconscious on the ground and a mother just hysterical and a big crowd around and I sort of said, that's, that's can I help? <laughs> that's, that's terrifying though, isn't it? Do, it you, do you just walk calmly into those situations yeah. and assess it? Whereas I would just sit yeah. there in no, terror. I always am quite calm. Uh, it's time slows down for me in those situations because I'm confronted with that sort of thing in the hospital fairly frequently. Right. And it, it does go in slow motion and I have a checklist of things in my head. I, uh, I often run the scenarios in my head as to what I would do because sure. usually often you are the doctor on the scene and yep. um, it happens not more often than you would think uh, on aeroplanes and difficult situations that um, you may not have any equipment around. Mm. Uh, and it's not my first, it's probably the most spectacular one I've had but it's not the first one I've had to go to. Right. Um, that gets so time slows down. There's a checklist, and you start telling people what to do, and you do what you have to do. So what? So what did you did? The child had swallowed um, a biscuit, or was yeah, choking she on a biscuit. Choked on a biscuit, mm. and she stopped breathing. And um, so I turned her upside down and beat her on the back, and put my finger in her mouth, which you're not supposed to do. But mm. I felt in the situation. <laughs> that, uh, but there wasn't much time, no, so you had to. No. Um, and then she didn't respond, so I gave her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and that blew the bit of cracker down, and right. and she started breathing again. Okay, and, and then you just ambled off. Then you just well, left. You arrived, <laughs> you saved the day, and then you left. Well, you're never quite sure. <laughs> what, so, I mean, you, you're waiting for a round of applause or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, I sort of go off and have a coffee myself, and then and then I start sort of getting a bit shaky. Yes. <laughs> when that's happened. Yes. Um, and so, yeah. And, the, yeah, and so then you had a teary mother on local radio saying, I just uh, really want to thank this doctor. So, <laughs> and tell us, so tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, so I, I was operating the next morning and um, the Madonna King calls into the operating theatre and from the ABC <laughs> and says, we want you on so the radio bossy. now. And <laughs> the mother's called in. And, and it was lovely to, to talk to her on the radio. But it was quite emotional because I, I've got four babies and I just mm. know... Oh, it's just such a helpless situation, and um, I just knew exactly how she felt. So, yeah. yeah. One of the really hard parts of your job, these are obviously the beautiful moments where everything comes together, but there's the hard moments as well when you have to deliver the bad news. Mm. And and you're not one of these standoffish specialists. You no. you you're, you're friends with your yeah. patients, and you embrace them, and yeah. you care about their lives. Yeah, I do. There's a lot of hugging that goes on in my yeah. surgery, but <laughs> 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 and. Um, and I mean, I tell people, I, I think I t have to tell someone every day how their life is going to end. And um, it's, it's... Do you ever get used to that? Ne never. No. It, and you, the way it begins is you find, you see the x-ray result before the patient comes and say, no, you know. And sometimes it's a patient you've been looking after for some time, the cancer's come back and, and you know. And um, it, it's a terrible thing every time. It's a terrible thing. And you see, it's funny though that people react exactly the same e right. every single time. Really? Um, and how yeah. is that? Do you just see the range of emotions come. First, the, they can't believe what they've heard. Um, then I give, them, I give them some time. Then I don't, I don't speak for some time after I've said the word cancer to them because they don't hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So you just wait and then your tears come and then the anger comes and mm -hmm. then the what can we do mm -hmm. and, then, and then finally the acceptance of, well, this is what's this is what will be. And because uh, often there is just nothing that can be done. No, very frequently. No. I mean, I usually, I, the most common scenario in my office is that they come with their x-ray and there is nothing I can do. Uh, and I have right. to establish this rapport with people w within literally two minutes of meeting them and tell them how they're going to die. And it's, it's a horrible thing that I take home with me. Uh, I feel a bit weird talking about it, to be honest. So yeah. it's, it's terrible. Yeah. yeah. Then there is that flip side that we were talking about at the shopping centre and, and you've said before that it is wonderful being in the cavalry and, and how wonderful that we as a society have 
people like yourself and the sure. cavalry ready? How does what? Well, I just have in my head sometimes when I'm in those situations that I think, I, I am not going to let this person die today. I just think, just sometimes I just think, mm. I'm sick of this. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, I, and I am going to get you back, yeah. baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's what I felt that day. I just It just happens sometimes, it comes over me. Yeah. 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 And that sort of tenacity, I think, all the people mm. speaking today mm. understand. That's a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. We better go. All right, I'd like to thank our wonderful guests today, Sally, Kelly, Yasmin, uh, Andrew, Nicole and Agrita for joining us today. I hope we've, uh, you've enjoyed Suburban Tales and I hope we've stirred your thinking and left you with a few ideas to debate afterwards. Thank you very much for coming today and have a wonderful day.